Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Madison. My guest tonight is a fascinating South African, Professor Ben Turok. Welcome, Ben. Thank it's you. It's a great privilege to have you here. You've led a fascinating life uh, dedicated entirely to the ANC. You've, uh, it's been dangerous, it's been exciting, it's been frustrating. Um, but before we go into the uh, more recent past, you, you're 89. You were born in uh, Latvia, and you were there the first seven years of your life. So from 1927 to 34. Do you have any recollection of that time? I do indeed. Strangely enough, <clears throat> I remember the environment that we lived in, which was a very fascist environment. Um, it, was, it was very anti-Semitic. Latvia was the first fascist country in Europe before Germany. Ah. And we had a fascist government and a fascist movement which was very reactionary, anti-Semitic, and so on. And I remember how my two brothers and I were chased by children from schools nearby and, uh, because you were Jewish? Yes. Ah. And uh, at some stage, my brother, my older brother, joined some kind of a left-wing group. And he had a, tie, a red tie. And we had a ceremony in our flat, and we burnt the tie because it was too dangerous. Ah. So my recollections are indeed uh, of being persecuted. Extraordinary. And anyway, you, at seven you came to South Africa, you went to the University of Cape Town, got a degree in land surveying. And, uh, uh, but in, those, in, the, in the 50s, you, you were the young kid in, in, the, in the treason trial and these things. Um, and I was looking at your history, 1956 was an extraordinary year. You were one of the uh, co-authors of the Freedom Charter. Uh, you were uh, on trial of the treason trial with Mandela and all the others. Um, but at the same time, you were also um, a member of the, the Transvaal Provincial Legislature representing Africans. That was an extraordinary time. Yes, it was. I mean, those were, like now, <laughs> extraordinary times. And uh, when I finished the university, and got my degree and all that, and my professional qualification, I then felt that the, the Defiance campaign had unrolled. I went overseas to do postgraduate studies, which I didn't complete, because the situation at home was very volatile. Yes. And uh, I wanted to come home. I couldn't wait. And uh, so I came home and went to see Ray Alexander of the trade union movement and said, I'd like to do some work yes. full time. And so I abandoned my profession, and she made me secretary of the uh, Metal Workers Union. I, mean, <laughs> I knew nothing about trade unions. And uh, I started a little thing called the Metal Workers Union. But very soon, what happened was that um, Brown Bunting was removed from Parliament. And uh, so the, the ANC came to see me and said, would I stand for Parliament? And I said, please, I'm only 26. I've never been anywhere near Parliament. I'm nervous. I couldn't do it. So I declined, and they, they chose Lee Warden as, as the MP. But then there came a treason trial in which I was a, I was a full-time organizer of the Congress of the People. And during the treason trial, <coughs> a vacancy occurred in the Western Cape Provincial Council. And the ANC invited me to stand, and I stood and I won without competition. There was no opposition. And so I became an MPL as a native representative. So um, um, you, you then, uh, are, 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 I want to move quickly to the present, but you did serve three years in prison? Yes. And um, then you went into exile, and you worked in Tanzania and many other places. You were also, um, in later years, you came uh, uh, after uh, you did a master's degree in, at Dar es Salaam. Uh, when when uh, uh, the ANC was unbanned, you came back here. Uh, you've been an academic in various contexts. But you also were training young ANC people, entrance into the ANC. Um, I now see. 
and of course you 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 right you're running a new agenda which we'll talk a little yes. bit more about and and that's something people should take a look at um, but I've not noticed you're very driven, and lately I've seen a huge number of uh, articles by you. You seem to have accelerated your pace. You're obviously very concerned about uh, where the country is going and where the ANC is going. But before we get into the current stuff immediately, I just want to talk about how you think about it. One of the things you've been writing about is the, the, the black middle class and the growth of it and, and um, the role of black business in helping the poor. Um, was it, do you think, the aim of Tabo, Becky, and Jacob Zuma, although they didn't put it in those terms, to create a black middle class? It was ambiguous. Quite frankly, if you read the stuff of Tabo of the late, uh, early 2000s and so on, there was a certain ambiguity about that. And the, indeed, the ANC has always said, we do not want to replace a white monopoly capitalist class by a black monopoly capitalist class. But isn't that what BEE does? It does, and it's wrong. And it's a mistaken, it's a, this new thing of social, economic social transformation, uh, emphasizing BEE and ownership. You see, what disturbs me a great deal is that ownership as we know internationally is not the solution to economic nationalism. You can own indirectly, you can have shares, you can be on the stock exchange and so on. It does not give you control of a company. We learned long ago that a small holding by a powerful company of say 15% is enough to control that company. You don't have to own the whole That's thing. That's how the Oppenheimer family controlled yeah, the Anglo-American. Yeah, oh. yeah. You don't have to own the whole thing. So control is the key thing. And with all the emphasis of ownership that is coming from black business and so on is a, is a fallacy. But what should the emphasis be on? We, we're going to take a break quite soon, but um, the emphasis should be on jobs. The emphasis should be on building the economy. You know, fortunately, there are now many, many more economists who are saying, forget about, don't forget about, but less concentration on the fiscus, on balancing the books, on the budget deficit, all those things are important. And by the way, I should say that even while I was a political activist, I also was an economic, economist and an academic activist. Yes. So I've been writing books for, I've published 23 books. And this doesn't happen by accident. So I've had a lifetime of publishing, of writing, of thinking, of lecturing, and so on. So I've tried to follow two tracks the political activism, but also the academic one. We're going to pursue both, both tracks after the break. And we're back talking to Professor Ben Turok. Um, Ben, I see in your writings, you're, you're trying to come up with solutions. You've been an ANC me a member of parliament for many years. You're no longer doing that. Uh, but uh, one of the things you say is that, you know, we talk about added value, beneficiation, more manufacturing, and yet it doesn't seem to happen. Uh, and you've been looking at why and trying to understand it. What, what have you concluded? Well, I've concluded that the government is not doing enough in terms of incentives, in terms of policy. I talk to big business a lot because I'm doing research now for all kinds of big agencies. And I'm doing research through my institute, the Institute for African Alternatives, about which I'd like to say a bit more. We've published the journal. We've come to the conclusion that the economic policy in South Africa is, is adrift. It's, yes. it's too loose. No direction. We talk about a developmental state, but we don't do anything. No. And if you look at the resolutions of the ANC, conference after conference, full of high moral tone, full of high moral judgments, no implementation. Instead, we appoint crooks in all sorts of institutions. So, you know, there's this mismatch between the talk and the doing and the talk and the appointments. Yes. Uh, the reality is that a public service is now decimated and rather weak. And the economic policy making, if you look at the Economic Transformation Committee of the ANC, 
which is supposed to be developing economic policy for the country, is terribly weak and is focused on the financial sector. But isn't that a problem that we've had for some time? I mean, even before the more extreme corruption of the Zuma era, uh, uh, one of the things you, I, I read that you wrote recently has to do with the fact that we don't put the energy and effort and, and depth of commitment into solving problems like uh, added value in mining, for example. You know, I don't want to be critical of Madiba. He did a wonderful job and yes. a great man. But if we had to wind back the clock and ask me for a priority in 1994, yes. I would say skills training, yes. I would say research, I would say the economy, <coughs> and the fiscus, of course, but in context. We didn't do that. We closed down the teacher training colleges. We closed down the apprentice, agricultural research the apprentice system. Apprentice system. It was criminal. But you know, I've been uh, researching, of all things, Professor Jonathan Janssen's uh, PhD thesis in 1991 when he was looking at the Zimbabwe education system. And what he found there that was the same thing was done there. We're not learning the lessons. No, we're not. And, and Madiba, look, there were some of us in the RDP, the Reconstruction Development Programme. And uh, we advocated what I'm saying now, the training and the skills and so on. Yes. Lay a foundation, in, especially in the black community, you know, training, skills. You know, if you go into any rural town in Ponderland or Transkei, if somebody has a broken window, they can't fix it. They have to go to East London or Port Elizabeth. But why were these things not listened to? Why did they cl close all these things down? They, because there was a lot of international pressure on, from the IMF and World Bank to observe fiscal discipline. And our people gave way. And but you know, I had many discussions. <coughs> I was in the Finance Committee for 20 years. Many discussions with Trevor Manuel, you know, who's, who's not an enemy of the people, you know. Why is it that you put so much emphasis on the fiscus and so little on the real economy? Yes. And, and so to come back to the present, I mean, there is a crisis in South Africa. Yes. The economy is not performing, and our institute is beginning to do hard, serious thinking through a new agenda. By the way, we're moving into new premises. We're moving into a community center in Salt River Road in two weeks' time. And we're going to be running seminars and public lectures on the economy. We're going to be inviting the best economists in South Africa to come, even those who like fiscal discipline or consolidation is a new term. Let them come and debate and defend these virtually orthodox policies that are being used in the West, in the United States, why are we applying it in a developing country? But isn't our problem less that we're doing that than that we're not doing the other? We're not doing the implementation you talked about uh, because then you've got to commit to the government to do extensive work with our economy as it is, come up with solutions and put, and you have to have competent ministers who will put their weight behind it. Well, let me say straight away, Rob Davis is a very competent right, person. Right, right. He's a smart guy and he knows his stuff. Right. His department is not quite so good. Mm -hmm. And uh, his officials tend not to be strong. It was weak in the Mbeki era too, frankly. Yes. Well, I've been there 20 years. You know? I've been in that portfolio committee yes. a long time. And we've seen official after official arrive, promoted because of race or gender, and no, not having a good background. You know, we have not chosen good people to run our country. Well, what's the answer? How do you turn that around? It's political as much as it's very. It's very political, and I would say what you must not do is appoint people like Malefe, you know, who are competent, but who... You're talking about Brian Malefe. Brian Malefe. <coughs> he's competent, but he's misguided and he's made serious mistakes, and you don't promote a person like that to the top of the tree, which looks like it's going to happen. So we have made, uh, take the latest case of Prasa. You know, here's a cowboy who's an ordinary public servant and made head of Prasa. And what does he do? He gives himself five, five million rand. You know, I mean, a person like that should really be in jail. I mean, you know, 
this is, it's a symptomatic of greed of a culture. You cannot build a developmental state based on culture, on greed. And I'm afraid the ANC documents say again and again that this kind of behavior is filtering all the way down to local municipalities. So it's not just a few people at the top. It's going down to the provinces, to the municipalities, bad con misconduct, corruption, rot. And so the problem is deep, which is why they can't come up with solutions. Because if you come up with a solution, people won't say, well, what's in it for me? Now, you're uh, part of the group of stalwarts, the 101 uh, senior ANC figures like yourself, who are trying to pressure the leadership of the ANC to, uh, uh, to, to, to change its ways in a substantial way, including the position of the president. We'll talk about that when we come back. And we're back talking to Professor Ben Turok. Ben, uh, I've noticed the speed of your writing is, is, has, has accelerated. Uh, I see things in the Daily Maverick, in the Business Day, all over the show, and of course in your new agenda. Um, you seem to see special urgency, and I wonder if it isn't spurred part, not only by the politics, but also by your health. You've had health issues. Yes, I have, and uh, I was ill for a while um, last, last year, but I'm on the way back, and I'm much better, and I'm able to come on your program. <laughs> And we're very glad to have you. Um, so uh, you're, you're so driven now to, to find changes. Um, and I know that the stalwarts have been meeting with the, uh, with the leadership of the ANC. Um, can the ANC be saved? It's problematic. And I would say I'm not sure. The signs, look, uh, there are very simple requirements from the 101. One, that the national leadership, namely the National Working Committee and the top six, must admit that they have made very serious mistakes and they have failed in some respects. Not all, but some respects. They must admit that. If they don't admit that, there's no progress. Secondly, they must admit that the documentation of the 101, there's a, do a conference, uh, a document for the state of our future, for the sake of our future, uh, which sets out a viable moral position for the movement. And we want the leadership to acknowledge that this is a good document. They can't agree with every word, that's fine, never do, but the general thrust of the document is correct. They have not done that yet. And in fact, at a recent meeting a few days ago, some members of the NWC said, we don't like the document. We don't agree with the harsh, criti harsh criticism. Yes, it's harsh. It's harsh because the situation is harsh. And the prospects are worse. I mean, I anticipate that if there were an election tomorrow, that the ANC would do worse than it did in the last election. And the ANC's lost Gauteng. Yes. So, you know, the situation is worse. And when you have lost Gauteng, you've lost a great deal. And, uh, um, but, but that means that they're not admitting to those two things, that they've made big mistakes. They and are making talking. platitudes. You see, you know, <laughs> the 101 people published a doc, did a lot of research, went back to ANC documentation for the last 15 years on what the ANC said at national conferences on moral issues. And they published all the documents, the sentiments, and so on. It's all wonderful. ANC has a wonderful tradition of moral judgments, okay, high moral tone. And then you say, well, Zuma, Kandla, Brian Malife, and so on. Who's doing all this? Yes. Is it the DA? No, it's the ANC. So, you know, high moral tone won today, and tomorrow you appoint corrupt people and, and, and give them a, a license to do what they want. Could you, could you walk away from the ANC? I don't feel the need to. I feel that somebody else should walk away. 
My, I, I belong to NC. I've been a long time, as you indicated. I've been loyal for years and years. I've never been a, 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 a somebody who toes the line. You know, I've been in trouble before, you know, and uh, because I speak out. I mean, I was in trouble over the protection of the secrecy bill. I remember in Parliament you refused yeah, to vote I refused for it. To vote, yes. So I have been in trouble for taking a stand on occasion, not wildly and not not all the time, but occasion when I thought it really important. And I think it's time to take a stand now. I'm absolutely horrified by what's going on in the public service. This Prasa story, this this corruption, the theft of resources, the ESCOM story, so many. I'm horrified. And I'm horrified and that South Africa is going to go down the drain and become a kind of Zimbabwe number two. Wouldn't it be better for the ANC to lose power, for a, at least to, for, a, for, for, a, for a, a, a term? Well, the trouble is if they lose power for one term, it'll be forever. Because once you lose your credibility as a party, I mean, if you don't change your leadership and you lose power and the same leadership comes, that's our problem at the moment that ANC wants to go to national conference this year and policy conference with the same leadership and p piously declare moral high ground, you see, and then go to the election. But you see, it's the same people. Who going to believe them? I mean, frankly, who trusts Zuma? You know, frankly. And he can proclaim what he likes. But he, Mkandla is his is albatross. But now the stalwarts, uh, uh, including you, have said that the bottom line had to be that there had to be a consultative co conference like was held twice in exile, and, and that must not be organized by the current leadership because they've compromised themselves. But if you don't get that, and it starts to look like you won't, uh, then it's do or die for you, isn't it? No, it isn't. I've said to them, the leadership, let's begin the 101. I said, let's begin to prepare for an alternative NCC, if the ANC leadership won't cooperate and won't... You'll have your own. Have own. Look, I am willing to spend my last buck going to Joburg and going to a conference, my own money. And there are thousands of people like me who are willing to do that, to sacrifice, and, and more. And uh, we will put our hands in our pockets and we'll do what we have to do in order to have it. Look, I attended the MK Council meeting. Yes. There were, you know. Controversies were. Yes. Controversies were. You know, there were a thousand people there. <laughs> ANC did not pay for them. Who paid for them? I don't know. But they were there, a thousand, and all critical and, uh, you know, on the same page as we are. See, so Piba Nyanda was excellent. Joan Lechitenzi was excellent. I, I agreed with everything they said. And do the others, most of the others of the 101 agree with you that if you have to, you'll have to have your own con it's, con it's conference? Under it's under discussion. I don't know. Because there's so many meetings taking place now that it's not clear where, where this, all this is going. But I'm saying that as a backstop, if the NWC will not allow an independent NCC in its own terms, with its own document, then to hell with it, we do our own. Well, that certainly means that uh, 2016 is going to be politically an exciting year. 17. 17, 2017, I'm sorry. I wanted to just, uh, we'll, 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 sh we'll show the audience this new agenda, Born Free, Born in Chains. Uh, um, that was Ben, ben Turok, who's been doing these things for a very, very long time. Thanks so much for coming, Ben. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to have you. Uh, well, that's our show. Thanks for watching. Good night and happy reading.